I've just sent a message to Bob. Um, so hopefully, you know, he's not having any technical issues in joining. Hope he knows who to I haven't received any emails. Other than that. Yeah. Okay. He was asking me for my slides about 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. So he may be formulating the last few things at the last second. Uh, his, his password is uh, not working. I think he's he may be using the wrong password, yeah. you know, not the panelist one. Yes. yes. I've sent him the new link um, with the password. Yeah, I forwarded Courtney's message to him. You know, I had the same issue. Uh, the the link um, on the Outlook calendar for me was different from the it's email. The email. Last night. Yeah, you got to use the email. Yeah. So he's doing it now. He's just texting me. Okay. Yeah, it's confusing. Yes, so we will just wait for Bob to kick off the meeting. Um, he's in possession of the most updated slide deck as well, uh, which I don't have. So let's just wait. We can make polite conversation about the weather. Eighty-five here today. Oh wow. Wow. I heard Seattle yeah, weather was good though. My family called and said that there was 80 degrees up there last week. Yeah, yeah. yeah last week. Mm -hmm. Last week was, was very nice. It's pretty darn cold um, here in Charlotte right now, which is quite unexpected. We we had, you know, spring kind of weather the past two weeks, uh, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s, and suddenly. We're waking up to below freezing temps this week, so it's funny. That's the worst because you get a little tease of the spring to come and then it's ripped away. <laughs> yeah, people in my team have issues too with that link. Bob says he, he gets an error message that the email doesn't match any of the panelists. Yeah, is, can is our tech support yeah. still on? Yeah. They're still on. I'm not sure why the link is working for some and it's not working for others. Um, it's been kind of iffy all week and that's why I wanted to send out the attendee link um, just in case and then we're able to move you to the stage. So I'm monitoring that um, throughout the session as well. Yeah, it's not working for my team either. I don't know. It worked for me. And okay, Anthony, me Robert Orlowski them. is in the audience. Can you move him up to the stage? That's who we're waiting on. I think, I think they'll be trying to change the uh, email ID to their own while I think we are supposed to keep the email ID with the, the C Willie at swag, swag.org. I think that may be causing the problem. Hey everyone, sorry for the trouble, but first it wouldn't take my password. Then it said my email didn't match that of any of the panelists. So it uh, 
took me a while to get in. Sorry about that. Hope everyone's doing okay on a Friday. Yes, sir. Okay, let me see if I can't. Hmm. Could somebody activate my share button because it doesn't seem to be selectable at the moment. Ah, thank you very much. All right. Let me try to pull up the slides that I prepared, especially for all of you wonderful, fine people in this meeting. Ah, there we go. Finally, we're getting there. Okay, can you all see the slides now? Yes, we can. Hope you heard my fake Southern drawl. So welcome everyone to the virtual meeting for SWOG. And of course, uh, you probably saw the picture that they sent us on the cover of the agenda, just to remind us of where we would have been had this happened in person. And of course, we're now holding it virtually. So it's both in San Francisco and your hometown. This is just an overview of the current leadership with Brian Dury and Saad Usmani as vice chairs and Susan O'Brien as the executive officer and Anche Horing, Rachel Sexton and Adam Rosenthal as our intrepid statisticians. And these are some of the scientific leaders, including Brian Walker on the translational medicine side, Chelsea Pinnix on the radiation side, uh, Jay Sybil Bierman for surgery, and Saad and Eric Roran on imaging, and Fritz Van Rie for early therapeutics. And then other designates include people involved in digital engagement, NCORP representation, data coordinators, and various oncology research professionals. And of course, a big shout out as always, and thank you to Jack Aiello, who's our patient advocate, and also to Melissa Biddle, our protocol manager, and Sandy Hita, who's our clinical trials project manager. This is just an overview from the SWOG meeting agenda of enrollment overall for 2020. And so you can see myeloma is at 265 and we're going to be climbing up that ladder, I think, pretty quickly. This is the monthly enrollment and myeloma is down here at the bottom. So you can see that we started off the year a little bit slowly and things went even slower during the first month or two or so of COVID, but we're now back up to a larger number than we were even at the beginning of the year. And we're actually third in terms of enrollment for the month of December among all of the other committees. Just to give you an idea of the trajectory, this is the past few years worth of enrollment and you can see that SWOG registrations have gone from 9 to 30 to 151. So wanted to thank everybody for their great hard work here and for the enthusiasm that everybody has had. And these are non-SWOG registrations in the middle as well as non-SWOG studies. So thanks again and hopefully we will continue along this trajectory for the next couple of years. And I thought this graph from the overall meeting agenda pamphlet was interesting about the impact of COVID and probably most of you would have expected that there was a big impact right at the beginning when none of us really knew for sure what was going to be happening and maybe we delayed treating some patients and maybe closed or at least temporarily halted enrollment to some studies and then things recovered to some extent later in the year as we realized that cancer was still a lot worse than COVID, although getting both, unfortunately, is the worst. 
And then this was a graphic overview of where all of the enrollments have been. So really thanks to everybody throughout the country and even in Hawaii and Alaska for everybody's great contribution. Also, a lot of patients and follow up, as you can see here, with about 400 patients in myeloma, and probably that number will grow as well. So let's go to our agenda, and we've got the usual list here, which are recently closed studies, and there's a few of those. The first one is the SO777 trial, which was led by Brian Dury. And you probably remember that this was a VRD or bortezomib lenalidomide and low dose dex versus just RD or len and low dose dex for either transplant ineligible newly diagnosed patients or those who were willing to defer transplant. And this was a 525 patient study, which everybody really enrolled well to. And thanks again. Brian, uh, are you perhaps on the call? Nope. Well, I wanted to have him have the opportunity to present the most recent data. And in case you haven't seen it, this just appeared last year in Blood Cancer Journal, which was a longer term follow up of the initial study experience. I won't go through the disposition and the response data, of course, were relatively similar as had been the case with the initial report. But here were the progression free survival data. So, again, you can see about a 12 month improvement for the VRD group. There also was landmark analysis that Aunt Jay and her colleagues did on the study that showed that the PFS at a six month landmark was, of course, better for patients that had a higher quality response. In this case, the green curve with at least a VGPR and the duration of response was longer for VRD as well. These were the overall survival data updated, so the VRD continues to be better than was RD. I thought this analysis was interesting looking at age, which did show that VRD was better both for the under 65s, that's comparing the green curve, which is VRD, versus the blue curve, which is RD. And also VRD was better in the 65 and over, although maybe the difference wasn't as large, but it was still there. And that's comparing the folks that are in the yellow curve versus the folks that are in the red curve. This was landmark analysis looking at overall survival by response at 12 months. Again, people with a better upfront response did better. I thought it was interesting that the PR and SD curves were somewhat similar, although there was still a little bit of a difference there. And then there were a few second cancers that were noted as well. In both arms, you can see that there were some hematologic cancers, including MDS and leukemias, but also some solid tumors as well. Next is S1304, and maybe at this point, if Sikander is on the call, I can turn things over to him and he can present his data. But these were, of course, the personnel who led that study, and this was a comparison of low-dose carfilzomib dex versus high-dose carfilzomib dex in the relapsed or refractory setting with 143 patients that were enrolled. Sikander, do you want to take over if you're on the call? Uh, sure, Bob. Thanks a lot. Uh, so this, uh, the initial results from this study, the, basically the uh, clinical trial results were uh, presented and then subsequently published in clinical cancer research, comparing the standard uh, carfilzomib dex dose with the higher dose carfilzomib and dex. Uh, the study enrolled, uh, the study had a total of 121 patients with uh, the 64 patients in arm one, which was the standard dose arm, and then 57 in the high dose arm. And um, basically, uh, well balanced. We had a comparison of uh, response rates, response rates, uh, no significant difference. The primary endpoint was looking at PFS 
And uh, even in that setting, also no significant difference between the two arms. We did a lot of subset analyses with high risk, standard risk, patients with previous uh, lines of therapy and analysis by that one to three versus four to six. We even included patients who had had at least two months of treatment because early on in the study, we realized that some patients were coming off of the standard arm much faster uh, just because they would just not get a long enough duration of therapy because with carfilzomib, they would start at 20 milligram per meter square and then get escalated and that they were uh, falling off too fast. So we even did a quite a bit of those sensitivity analyses, but prior uh, progression free survival based on lines of therapy or based on prior bortezomib therapy, uh, no significant differences. Uh, and then from the PFS standpoint also, it was no, um, sorry, from the OS standpoint also, looking at all the patients, no specific differences. So uh, the results were published and we are currently working on the subsequent uh, associated um, uh, sub-studies that are ongoing. One is looking at the cardiac uh, sub-study because this clinical trial, well, actually before going on to that, I, I was just gonna say that the clinical trial uh, data was presented, but the cardiac sub-study is being uh, conducted right now. And then we also plan to do a PET imaging sub-study where we have baseline PET information collected on patients. So looking at the treatment-related adverse events, this is where we did find uh, some significant differences that the higher dose carfilzomib, it was associated with some um, uh, increased uh, incidence of adverse events, uh, cardiopulmonary, uh, fatigue, certain non-hematologic adverse events. Sorry, not cardiopulmonary. That was the conspicuous, no significant difference noted, but um, some uh, non-hematologic adverse events were noted to be different. So um, with that, basically, I don't have any further kind of updated information on this. This uh, publication was now a um, year or so ago. And we are working on the sub studies, which, uh, as I said, the analysis should be done hopefully soon. I don't know if we will have something in time for ASH or not, but the cardiac sub study is being done uh, quite uh, nicely and rapidly now, actually. So there is at least a possibility we may have some data to share at ASH um, regarding the cardiac sub study of standard versus high dose carfilzomib. All right, very good. Well, thanks for your leadership on this. And it took a while to get the answer, but I do think that the answers were interesting. I did have a quick question, Sikander, and let me go back to uh, this analysis here, because I thought this was kind of interesting. And I understand that the numbers were too small to reach a firm conclusion, but it did look like from this particular analysis that the patients who were refractory to bortezomib, it didn't matter if you got high dose or low dose, but it seemed that if you were not refractory, the high dose was substantially better. I mean, that's from five months to 12 months. Uh, that's correct, Bob. So looking at this, yes, it did seem that the absolute difference was significant, but one, this was kind of a subset analysis, so there was not any right. power to look at it, and it actually did not reach a, a level of significance even in that, because uh, with such smaller numbers, even one or two events in favor or against of one particular setup could make or break everything. So we did do all these analyses. We did look at them, um, these subgroups as well, but they did not get significance primarily from the fact that these were very small groups. But, but at least there was a suggestion that that may be going on. And it does sort of suggest that there may be some cross resistance between bortezomib and carfilzomib, which wouldn't be all that shocking. Okay. Yes. Well, thanks very much. Next on the agenda for closed studies is the S1211, which is the original high risk study, which was led by Saad Usmani. And this was the design you probably remember, which was RVD induction followed by RVD maintenance versus RVD ELO induction followed by RVD ELO maintenance. 
and the study accrued very well, 142 patients. Thanks again to everybody for participating in that. And here are the published data. So Saad, uh, let me know when you want me to advance, but I put in some of the, uh, I think, more salient pieces of data from your trial that you were able to get published in Lancet Hematology. This was a big effort by everybody, including Saad and Anche, to pull all of the data together. Uh, sorry that this is a little bit blurry, but do you want to talk to any differences in patient characteristics or adverse events before we get to the PFS data here? Uh, um, thank you, Bob. Um, so essentially, um, you know, there, there were no major differences between the patient characteristics across the two arms of the study, nor in terms of safety. Um, uh, but, you know, the, this is essentially the punchline slide. Uh, there was no difference between the PFS between the two arms of the study of RVD and RVD elotuzumab. Um, and uh, the PFS in the RVD arm was 34 months compared to 31 months in the RVD elotuzumab arm. And uh, we're still waiting for the overall survival um, to read out for the RVD arm. It was um, um, about 68 months median for the RVD elotuzumab arm. Uh, which in itself was, um, you know, a little bit surprising given this high-risk patient population. Um, but uh, you know, this this data will will serve as as a benchmark for for the future high-risk trials that that we are planning to design um, and move move through the cooperative group setting. Um, back to you, Bob. All right. Very good. Thanks very much. Next was the ECOG study of lenalidomide versus observation for smoldering myeloma patients. And Madhav Dadapkar was originally the SWOG champion for this before he moved to Emory. But you remember that this was in the second portion, uh, the initial portion was a safety run-in, but in the second portion, there was a randomization to lenalidomide single agent versus observation. And I think SWOG did a good job of accruing to this trial. You probably know that this appeared in JCO, and this was the manuscript. The response data are shown here for the phase two run in as well as for the phase three randomized portion. So lenalidomide alone in the larger experience had about, uh, you can see 40 patients out of the 88 who had a PR and four patients who had a VGPR, no complete responders. So the VGPR rate was four and a half percent in the randomized arm and the PR or better rate was 50%. These were the progression-free survival data with lenalidomide, of course, in blue and observation being in red. So doing something certainly delayed progression to symptomatic disease. This is the opposite category, if you will, which is the cumulative incidence of progression for the observation arm in red versus the lenalidomide in PD for blue curves. All of the subgroups actually benefited from lenalidomide more so than observation, although oddly enough in African Americans, there seemed to be a trend favoring observation, although the number of those patients was small, and so the confidence intervals are quite broad. And I think that certainly, uh, I, I wouldn't conclude from this that observation is better than lenalidomide for African Americans with smoldering disease, but it'll be interesting to see larger experiences. Because the trial had a mixture of patients in part, the definitions of smoldering were changed during the trial. So there was a subsequent retrospective analysis done looking at PFS differences in high-risk patients. So you can see that high-risk patients with lenalidomide in blue really did benefit. 
And as you might imagine, the differences among intermediate risk patients and low risk patients were a little bit smaller, in part because the number of patients in those subgroups is relatively low. But it does make the argument definitely that the high risk patients did benefit in terms of PFS, although there was no benefit yet seen with regards to overall survival data. And here are some of the adverse events, which I'm sure you're all familiar with what lenalidomide can do, which includes some risk for neutropenia as well as infection and there were some dermatologic effects, dyspnea, fatigue, hypertension, and hypokalemia. Next on the agenda here is the endurance trial, which of course was VRD versus KRD, and Jeff Zonder was the SWOG lead for this. You may recall that there was an initial randomization to the two different inductions, and then later on a second randomization to either LEN until progression or LEN for two years as a maintenance. And we don't have the data yet on the second randomization, but we do have the data on the first. And SWOG did pretty well here, 252 patients that were enrolled. So thanks again, everyone. Jeff, I don't know if you're on the call. Do you want to maybe go through briefly the published data if you are? Okay. Well, here are the patient characteristics, and because this was a more than 1,000 patient study, as you can imagine, the characteristics were pretty well balanced across the two arms. And this was the second part, which looked at things like cytogenetics. And you can see about a quarter of the patients had an abnormal cytogenetic profile. And almost 80% of patients had some kind of abnormality by FISH. These were the response data, and I'm sure you remember that the complete response rate, or better, was essentially the same in the two arms, although there was a small trend for the VGPR rate, or better, to be higher for KRD than was the case for VRD, but the PR or better was the same for the two arms. And you probably remember a virtually identical progression-free survival, as well as no difference as of the time of the report in overall survival. And these were some of the adverse events and the things probably to take note of were the fact that there were some increased risk of heart failure, as you can see in the third line down, 3% grade 3 and 1% grade 4 for KRD versus only 1% grade 3 for VRD. And there was a small trend towards increased numbers of lung infections as well, which is lower down 2% versus 5%. And here were other adverse events with Oddly enough, a little bit more hyperglycemia and, of course, as you would expect, a little bit more dyspnea with the KRD arm. Next on the closed to accrual list, although we don't have final data yet here, is S1702, which was the isatuximab study for previously treated AL amyloidosis. And this was Terry Parker from Yale who was leading this. So she provided some slides. And Terry, I'll turn it over to you and just let me know when you want me to advance these for you. Um, Terry, if you're on the phone, you're muted. If not, I'm happy to. Okay, yep, doesn't seem like Terry is on. So she provided these fancy slides about 1702 that turn very nicely, like pages in a book. And you can see here the leadership, which include champions from Alliance in Heather Landau and from ECOG with Erica Campagnaro. And Anche and Adam were the stats people here. 
The objectives were, of course, to look at the efficacy based on the overall hematologic response rate for this anti-CD38. Secondary objectives were to look at toxicities, time to heme response, duration of response, PFS, as well as OS. The design was to give esatuximab weekly in cycle one, and then every other week from cycles two through 24, and then to stop after two years and the standard pre-medications you would probably recognize. Updates are that the patient characteristics and preliminary safety data were presented at both the International Symposium on Amyloidosis as well as last year's American Society of Hematology. And these were the hematologic results. You can see an overall hematologic response rate of 77% with a median time to PR or better being very rapid, 1.1 months and one year estimated duration of response, 89%, and a pretty good estimated OS and PFS at one year. I think the OS is particularly impressive considering that these patients with amyloid, of course, are folks that have had a lot of disease burden often with organ involvement. So next steps are that all patients will complete the plan two years of therapy sometime in the fall of this year. And so probably we will have updated response and safety data, not for ASH, but potentially for ASCO of next year. And Terry is looking at evaluating organ response and also preparing a manuscript. And if you have any questions that are easy, send them to me. If you have any difficult questions, send them to Saad. All right, now we have currently enrolling studies and the major study that we have here is the maintenance trial, which is lenalidomide versus lenalidomide plus daratumumab, which is SWOG S1803. And this was the trial that formally was called the dramatic study. And because we're apparently not supposed to be using that name, I did find a reasonable substitute, which is shown here. And for those of you that don't read Hindi, which I don't, but Google Translate says that this is what dramatic looks like in Hindi. So I would propose that we use this glyph or this symbol for the study in the future to get around the issue. So Amrita, I think uh, you are gonna be hopefully joining in. If you're on, do you wanna take over the presentation after I've sort of taken the punchline? Thank you, Bob. I also am ashamed to admit I don't speak Hindi, so if someone else has to tell me how to say that word. <laughs> it certainly wouldn't be me. If it were Polish, I could tell you, but not Hindi. <laughs> okay, so it would be Natakia. Drama is Natak, dramatic not, not, is Natakia. Not <laughs> it could have been more, more like Dhiran, 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 like a movie. And, and you know, if, if it was more um like uh, musical that that would have been dramatic right Sikander? <laughs> yeah i think the swag meeting is becoming very vibrant now so <laughs> we can we can maybe get over to amrita <laughs> Uh, you know, you. that that tendency to make bad puns has worn off on you Sikander, from me <laughs> all right we'll turn it over to amrita uh, thank you thank you bob um so just everyone's familiar with the background in terms of lenalidomide maintenance and the big debate that I'm sure you hear from your patients is really how long do I need to stay on maintenance for? And obviously the good news is we have patients who are on maintenance years and years. I'm sure you all have them. patients now seven, eight, nine years on lenalidomide maintenance asking the question, when can I stop? Also, obviously many of us are now using daratumumab, both induction, relapse, and considering its use in maintenance therapy and where does it have a role. So this trial is to remind everyone testing the addition of daratumumab to the standard backbone of lenalidomide maintenance following single autotransplant, but also so asking that important question, can we develop a more 
uh, effective maintenance regimen, but equally importantly, asking the question with effective maintenance, can we also consider shortening the duration of therapy? Can we have the next slide, please. So there are other trials ongoing, also trying to ask these questions. I put them in here just to sort of remind people. They're somewhat different also, so I wanted to make that point as well. For example, the Origa trial, um, which also has a randomization to Len versus uh, Len Dara continuing um, up to three years, um, is one trial that's ongoing. The endpoint of this trial that was different, the endpoint is MRD negative conversion rate at 12 months, and then the secondary endpoint of, of PFS. Uh, next trial, also the Perseus trial, um, looking also, again, this trial is a little bit different because first of all, the induction is mandated. So RVD versus DARA RVD, there's consolidation. And then there is, um, basically a DARA rev versus rev maintenance and then again MRD stratification so where we are similar is in regards to that second randomization of the MRD positive versus negative patients um next slide please the trial that's really the mature completed is Cassiopeia and so to remind you that's DARA VTD versus VTD consolidation and while this is a trial that's mature and um, reported, the problem is it's not a true comparator in the United States because the maintenance is DARA monotherapy versus observation. So again, just to cement why our SWOG trial remains a very important question uh, to answer for patients. Next trial, um, next slide, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, not that quick for the next <laughs> trial, I'm Rita. So the good news is, that, well, as you see, we are accruing well, so fortunately, and this is to remind you the schema, we made adjustments to allow patients to be um, registered before or after their stem cell transplant, uh, which really helped us, I think, in terms of accrual for patients. Patients are then randomized to LEN or LEN DARA, it's subcutaneous DARA tumumab, which is also a, a, obviously very um, advantageous for patients. Patients get an MRD assessment that's optional at one year, though we certainly encourage patients to, to take advantage of that. And then the, the study-directed MRD assessment, it is at two years, and patients who are MRD negative are randomized to either continuing therapy on their assigned arm or stopping therapy. And they're followed until disease progression. Next slide. Eligibility, again, this is actually up to age 75, so that is very attractive as well in terms of allowing quite a broad range of patients. We recognize the field moves quickly and that many patients may start to get daratumumab as part of the induction, so that is certainly allowed. Patients will be stratified based on uh, if they had dara as part of induction or not. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, you'll see in parentheses, some of the timings have changed in terms of enrollment. And that is in regards to some of the issues that Bob addressed at the beginning of this meeting with the COVID challenges. Next slide. So the pr and primary endpoint is overall survival between the two treatment groups, understanding that this is a long endpoint to reach. So we do have secondary objectives of progression of pre-survival and MRD negative rates. And that really is gonna be our first readout, the 24 month MRD negative rate that will, we will after the last patients accrued, um, that we can hope for that as an early signal from this trial. Next slide. So this was the challenges that we faced last year that of course, everyone across the country faced and is well familiar with it in terms of transplant centers, recommendations from ash from the international myeloma society in regards to the role of, of transplant in myeloma during the pandemic and specifically recommending postponing the frontline transplants and those these are the patients that we were seeing for this trial um so the next slide so what we did and to just put, put uh i put the the old eligibility and then our COVID amendment so originally we required patients that had to be within 12 months of, of induction to be enrolled now we allowed up to 18 months and that is still ongoing in terms of our updated COVID memo uh we also allowed um 
enrollment post-transplant up to 270 days instead of 180 days. And even more importantly, we recognize there are some patients who didn't want to come back to the center because of COVID. And so we allowed them to go on lenalidomide maintenance, not on the study. And as long as it didn't progress, then when they were comfortable coming back to their center, they could be enrolled on the study. We recognize that patients who were on the study were also concerned about coming back to their transplant center and also concerned obviously with COVID. So we allowed up to a two week, I mean, two month delay of daratumumab for patients on that arm as well. So this is ongoing. We've updated that COVID memo and that this will stay in effect till the end of this year. Next slide. So again, thank you to everyone on this call in regards to their support of this study. Uh, accrual remains robust. Um, as you can see here, we're about a third of the way accrued, uh, 453 patients. Um, and then we anticipate our Canadian colleagues will be joining us in the second quarter. So we hope that that will also contribute to um, further robustness in our accrual. Next slide. Other important part that we're continually monitoring, and I thank Dr. Jacobs from Adapter for helping us with this, is in regards to the MRD samples that we're receiving. So two important points to make here, because we get a lot of inquiries, the results of MRD are blinded to, to, to us as well. So that we, the centers are, have been asking, can I get the results? Um, they will not be released. Um, so right now we're happy to report in terms of sample quality, we're doing quite well. We've had about 88% of, of samples have been successively identified as dominant sequences. So that's very well in keeping with what our projections were for a failure rate um, for samples and MRD analysis. So again, thank you to everyone who's who's working on this portion. And um, now uh, the other question that we get a lot, even now still ongoing, obviously as COVID has not gone away, is this question about local sites and understanding the challenges of patients traveling. And so we do, uh, I've included here the CTEP memo in regards to what options there are for patients and that really specifically then applies to the patients on the lenalidomide arm where there is a little bit of leeway that they can be seen at the local site because the lenalidomide is commercial lenalidomide as long as they're following the protocol rules, um, obtaining the necessary laboratory tests. But the patients on the, the daratumumab arm knew, do need to continue at their um, treatment site. Next slide. Um, last, but certainly not least, and most importantly, I, I wanted to acknowledge everyone who's been part of this uh, tremendous effort and um, you know continues to work very hard on this trial. So thank you, everyone. We get many inquiries every day, and people are terrific about responding uh, very promptly uh, to all the concerns from. Um, the participants in the study. So thank you. And Amrita, when you had the 88% success rate for identifying a dominant clone, is it fair to say that at least some of those failures were probably because the patients were already in complete remission uh, at the time that the sample was obtained, and so there was no dominant clone left to characterize. Is that fair to say? Uh, I think it's really been more a function of just the initial sample, either not being able to retrieve it, DNA from that original sample is just failing QC. That's really been the biggest challenge that I've seen. I gotcha. Okay, thank you. Very good. Well, again, thanks everybody for the wonderful enrollment. I think originally had we planned on um, seven years for enrollment, am I remembering correctly or was it six? My recollection was six years. Six years. So I think we're at uh, a third of the trial, essentially, well, let's call it 18 months in. So especially with the Canadians joining, which will help further, 
we probably will be able to get this enrolled a year, if not a little bit more than that ahead of schedule. So thanks everyone. And do keep in mind, we're still gonna run this for a few more years and there's still lots of opportunity for you to participate. Next is follow up on some of the proposed trials. And these are studies that are not yet ready for you to open at your sites, but that have gone far enough in the discussion and concept stages that they probably will be coming your way. One that probably doesn't quite fit into that category, but we did want to let you know that there is another concept coming for high risk patients is the follow up here to S1811. Uh, Saad or Brea, do you want to briefly update the group on where planning is for the next high risk study? Uh, certainly, I, I, I can chime in. I was hoping that Brea will be um, here um, um, to share share the information. Um, uh, so, with the new clinical trial uh, design, um, in, initially we had um, um, uh, garnered support from um, Amgen um, for a KRD versus KRD daratumumab. Um, uh, randomized uh, phase three study for high risk multiple myeloma patients. Um, that support, uh, unfortunately, uh, was withdrawn um, middle of last year, um, um, and we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, the current schema that we are considering um, incorporates a quadruplet um, induction and um, dose modified maintenance uh, for high-risk patients compared with addition of a BCMA directed by specific added to the uh, quadruplet therapy as induction, followed by a maintenance strategy, a novel maintenance or consolidation maintenance strategy with um, um, an anti-CD38 antibody um, along with uh, the BCMA by specific. Uh, we are quite early in discussions um, and um, and have uh, further calls uh, with our pharma colleagues uh, later to discuss if we need to make any changes or tweaks to this protocol. Um, but um, you know, uh, please, if if anyone is interested or has ideas, feel free to reach out to me or Brea. Um, thank you so much. All right, very good. Thanks, Saad. And we're going to go through a couple of the studies now that will be hopefully coming your way soon. And the first one I'll turn over to Sikander, who's going to talk about his vibrant study. And he can also tell us apparently how to now pronounce its new name. So, yes, this is one of the uh, words that could be or one of the meanings of the word vibrant, so jivant, alive. But uh, I guess vibrant could be a lot of different uh, uh, possibilities. Anyways, just to kind of quote unquote burst that bubble for everybody, we are not being allowed to move forward with these names. I'm glad that Amrita was able to at least get the dramatic in. Um, but this is a concept that is actually quite far along and we are hoping to get this available to the sites very soon. This is S2005, a phase two randomized study comparing venetoclax with or without a brutinib and rituxan in previously untreated Waldenstrom patients. Uh, uh, Dr. Botani, Devaya Botani from Colombia is uh, one of my co-chairs for this. Devaya is all on the call, so please Devaya, feel free to jump in. Uh, once I've kind of briefly gone over the study, feel free to add anything uh, you sure. feel you may have missed. So the primary endpoint for this study is complete response rate in the two arms. The secondary response uh, uh, endpoints, objective response rate, PFS, safety, time to best response, overall response rate, and then there would be exploratory endpoints. The main idea was that a brutinib protoxin is used in uh, Waldenstrom's, but uh, we are hoping to see if we are able to get deeper responses, change the disease course, the, the natural history of the disease in Waldenstrom. And the study has some interesting aspects of, for example, fixed duration treatment rather than um, treatment and progression. And I'll touch upon that on our uh, schema. Uh, Bob, next slide, please. So um, 
As I mentioned, the background is primarily uh, based on the fact that Ibrutinib is FDA approved, Ibrutinib rituximab is uh, used based on Innovate trial, but the depth of response is not really seen. With Ibrutinib rituxan, the complete response rate was roughly around 2%, and overall response rate was 70%, and um, safety was not too much of an issue. So the thought is that Benetoclax has provided the depth of response in certain B lymphoid malignancies like CLL, where even MRD negativity is achieved, do we have an opportunity to make a significant dent on the Waldens from natural history? Next slide, please. <coughs> so from that standpoint, just uh, the idea was to combine ibrutinib, <coughs> venetoclax, and uh, rituximab because ibrutinib, venetoclax is ongoing as a phase two single arm trial already. Uh, no uh, concerning side effect uh, profile noted so far in our discussions with AbbVie Genentech. Uh, so next slide, please. The uh, plan is for this study to have eligibility for newly diagnosed Waldenstrom patients. We did note that quite a few patients, especially in the community setting, may get rituximab treatment every now and then for Waldenstrom, neuropathy, et cetera. So the study will allow prior treatment with rituximab up to eight weekly doses, as long as the last treatment with rituximab was at least 12 months prior. So the patient should not have been treated with rituximab in the last year. Performance status zero to two, no grade three or four peripheral neuropathy. The creatinine clearance would be 30 or higher, um, standard criteria for uh, LFTs. Uh, we did say that the platelet count of above 50,000, hemoglobin above 8, and ANC above 1. So we did loosen this up a little bit, as a lot of other trials have used a 75,000 cutoff for um, platelets, but we thought that that would be reasonable to drop down to 50,000. Next slide, please. So the schema basically is a randomized phase to design. Arm 1 would be brutinib with rituximab. Arm 2 would be brutinib, rituximab, and venetoclax. There will be a safety run-in with the three-drug uh, portion. And after the three-drug uh, safety run-in has been completed, that's when the randomization will start. Uh, there will be... Uh, the, the plan is that if anybody with a brutinib and rituximab progresses during the first two uh, years of treatment, then they would actually cross over to the three drug arm. Now, we don't anticipate a large number of patients to do, undergo this crossover, but still we felt that would uh, be an interesting question to ask. The patients will have a fixed duration treatment of 24 months. On the three drug arm, 24 months, and on the uh, two drug arm also, if they stay on the two drugs, then 24 months, but if they cross over, then a total of, uh, then from the time point of crossover, 24 months. And then treatment stops, uh, and the patients progress to event monitoring. The thought is also to try and figure out if fixed duration therapy would be more beneficial rather than continuous uh, treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, we are uh, saying that the historical CR rate for a brutinib rituximab was reported 2% for the sake of calculation, say 5%, and we're projecting a complete response rate for the three drug arm to be 30%. Now, I, this is one place where I will uh, put a plug in because this study will be coming forth very soon to your uh, centers and you would have the opportunity to open it. Since the primary endpoint is complete response, I do want to say that getting that bone marrow biopsy, if the patient otherwise meets the criteria for a CR, would be extremely important to complete. And this is going back to at least my own experience with S1304, which was standard versus high-dose carfilzomib where we realized that actually in neither arm, uh, in either arm, there were no CR, uh, CRs reported, which the main reason was that the patients never had the confirmatory uh, bone marrow biopsy that would have confirmed the CR rate. So that would be very important to keep in mind for everybody. I understand that sometimes it may not be done in routine practice, but it's an important portion, primary endpoint. Uh, then some statistical markers. We have we are saying that the projected accrual would be over three years, uh, possibly lesser because we do have buy-in from uh, the other cooperative groups as well, and we will stratify the patients for prior rituximab treatment versus not. We plan to do tissue banking uh, for uh, there are specific time points where um, tissue will be banked for correlative studies, but we'll be looking for extramural funding. I do also want to point out that the tissue banking is only to be done at baseline and then at certain fixed points, for example, 
if a matter is being done for progression, for complete response, etc. We we have dis we made it specific that this would not burden the sites unnecessarily. I think that's all the information that I had. This study, uh, from an update standpoint, the Central IRB has reviewed it. Um, that uh, review came in just yesterday, and there, some stipulations were or some clarifications were asked, which are not that difficult. So we hope that probably by uh, early next week or hopefully we'll be able to submit those responses. If Central IRB approves, I guess uh, NCI approves or looks at it and approves it, uh, and the study would be activated and available to you. Uh, Devaya, any thoughts that you had? Uh, anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, this was great. Yeah, you covered everything. Very good. Well, thank you. It'll be exciting to have something for Waldenstrom, which will be the first trial that we have through SWOG, at least over the time that I've been privileged to serve as chair. So that'll be nice. Thanks again for everyone's hard work and look forward to your enrollment. We also have a couple of concepts that are fairly far along from Patrick Hagen, and we don't have any names for these trials yet, and so no Hindi versions of it here, but I'll try to maybe work on that for next time. In the meantime, Patrick, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bob. I guess I'll need to do some sort of focus group to come up with a fancy name here, but that's not the focus of today's talk. So, um, <laughs> so this is a, a concept that we've been developing in the committee in conjunction with the Transplant Committee, um, looking at um, uh, kind of the ongoing role of second trans in a myeloma, which has kind of always been controversial to some degree, but specifically looking at when patients relapse um, following a good remission duration after their first transplant. Should we be continuing to use our standard melphalan dosing, or should we consider intensifying the PrEP regimen with this regimen of usulfan, melphalan, and Belcade? So, um, so this is the objective of the study. So it's uh, to compare the intensified regimen um, to a standard melphalan regimen, um, followed by uniform isotuximab maintenance. So um, I'll go through the study schema, but all patients after the second transplant will get a uniform approach in terms of the maintenance. Um, and our primary study goal is to, to achieve at least a 12 month improvement in the median PFS following the second transplant. So we can go to the next slide. So I think importantly in terms of feasibility and although, you know, uh, some places they're showing they're, they're doing less second transplants in general. If you look at the CIV MTR data, which is shown here, um, really that's not been shown to be the case. We're pretty consistently doing between six to 700 of these a year. And kind of importantly, appropriately so, most of these are patients who have long remission durations, which is shown here in the column. You know, about 80% of patients have a greater than a 36 month um, progression free after their initial transplant uh, who are actually getting a second transplant. Um, so, so we're doing them, we're doing them in the appropriate patients um, based on the historical data. And then in the upfront setting, kind of shown here at the bottom, what we're really seeing recently, both in our kind of phase two experience here um, at Loyola, where we did a comparison to a CIV MTR cohort, as well as in the randomized phase three up data from the group um, at NMD Anderson, is that when we intensify the PrEP regimen, we're seeing an improvement in progression free survival. Um, and then the MD Anderson experience as a randomized phase three, I mean, that's more than a 20 month improvement. So this is pretty significant. And then I would just say, interestingly, we don't necessarily see improved depths of responses, but those patients who get into a good response are maintaining it longer. Um, so it does come with some increased toxicities, which I'll allude to in a minute, but in general, this is what the data shows. So if we can go to the next slide. So, and then furthermore, we know there's preclinical data and actually clinical data now that shows that you know, bortezomib or proteasome inhibitors in general do sensitize myeloma cells to DNA damage. Um, and although it's been kind of studied in a variety of different schedules, this has really been consistently shown to be the case. So, so we feel it's time to look at this in the second transplant setting and long patients were able to achieve those long remissions. And then again, as I said, regardless of what arm um, patients on this trial would be put on in terms of the chemotherapy at the time of transplant, all patients would go on to a uniform isotuximab maintenance, a CD38 monoclonal um, following transplant. And, that's because of um, favorable toxicity profile. We feel 
as well as many patients will have received DARA previously, and I'll kind of go into the details of that in just a second. And then importantly, you know, our partnership with Sanofi and their, their support of the study, which is obviously important as well. So next slide. So just in terms of who would be eligible for the study, so so again, we want long remissions after the first transplant because those are the patients that benefit the most. So at least 18 months remission duration, they would have to be eligible for a second transplant and ablative prep regimen at that at the, for their local institutional um, policies. They would have to have measurable disease at time of relapse, although we would include non-secretory as long as there is a, a bone marrow involvement of greater than 10 percent, and then kind of rarely those with extra medullary disease only. But those patients do tend to relapse early, so it would be a small minority here. And then also importantly in terms of feasibility, so when patients do relapse following their first transplant, they can be treated with any um, uh, therapy um, for their referring doctor or yourself, it's your patient, as long as they're able to achieve at least a partial response. So again, the data would really say that the benefit of second transplant, just like first, are those who are responding to therapy as they head into it. We would allow one to two lines of therapy after relapse, so no more than three total lines of therapy. So a patient could relapse after their first transplant, progress, then go on to another line of therapy. And again, as long as they're able to achieve that response, they would be eligible. Um, patients can be previously treated um, or progressed on daratumumab, but they couldn't be refractory. Um, so again, this could be a patient who was on our SWOG maintenance study on the doublet arm getting the dara. Eventually, they progressed as long as they're able to achieve a, a response with their reinduction and then be transplant that they would be eligible. They obviously have to have uh, stem cells available for a second transplant. Um, usually, this will be stored, but we would allow remobilization. And then kind of some important exclusion criteria. So no previous tandem autos, previous allo. Again, can be refractory to the investigational agents. Um, and then kind of some standard organ criteria. Next slide. This is the treatment schema. So again, patients would be eligible um, for local institutional guidelines for a second transplant, a blade of second transplant. They would achieve at least a partial response to reinduction. They would then be randomized in a one to one ratio to either the intensified approach versus the standard melphalan. Importantly, this is stratified based on remission duration, RISS stage, and response to um, pre transplant to reinduction. Treatment arm B is standard melphalan 200, and treatment arm A is the intensified approach with um, PK based busulfan dosing, and then again, bortezomib at day minus one. All patients go on to isotoxin maintenance between 90 and 100 days post transplant with a standard dosing. Um, the primary endpoint, as listed on the bottom, is PFS, and then some important secondary endpoints, um, including some correlatives that I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, and then, really important here is quality of life. So, we do know that there is some short term um, increased mucositis with this regimen, but we want to look at short term and long term quality of life to see if patients who are obviously remaining in remission would have a better quality of life in the long term. Next slide. Thank you. So our primary endpoints, like I alluded to, are would be progression-free survival. Again, comparing our Bumelvel regimen to the standard melphalan with one interim analysis for futility. We would expect about a 24-month PFS in the standard arm, and this is based on um, some recently published data out of, out of Germany. Um, and we would hypothesize uh, about a year improvement in the, in the PFS for the experimental arm. We're looking to accrue about 62 patients a year for a total of 250. Again, this is about 10% of the patients who are undergoing second transplants, so I would think it's very feasible. And then we have an 80% power again to detect the uh, improvement in the PFS that I've alluded to. Also important, although we've seen these longer remissions, you know, we're building in some important correlatives we feel like to look at what's happening actually at the myeloma stem cell level with alkylator based damage, um, MRD assessments by flow, um, et cetera. So we can kind of understand a little better why maybe these patients are achieving longer remissions if this ends up being the case in a randomized study. Uh, next slide. Okay. And then also important, I just uh, mentioned these correlatives and then support from Sanofi in terms of um, feasibility of study completion. Um, the MRD, we will we'll be doing experimental, but it'll be next gen flow. Um, just because there's a lot of um, heterogeneity in terms of standard MRD assessments. Um, so as opposed to doing it commercially, it will be experimental, but um, with standard methodology by flow. Um, and I think that's the last slide I had. Right, yeah. Um, so I guess what I would say is the study has passed um, the executive committee in SWAG. It was just presented at actually the NCI steering committee just earlier this week for hopefully a formal endorsement. 
um, through them and the BMT CTN. So that's kind of the next step is kind of hearing back um, from them, but it continues to move forward. Very good. And then also you have another concept, which is for transplant yay or nay for AL amyloidosis. And here are the slides for that. So take it away. Perfect. Well, let's keep going. So, um, so this study is earlier in development, um, but it's been really kind of a, a, a labor of love with a lot of support by many people here in SWOG listed here, although not even everybody, to be honest, as well as some kind of work with the folks in ECOG. So um, with the recently um, uh, completed Andromeda study, we, we feel like this is an important time to kind of ask what is the ongoing role for high dose melphalan and transplant in amyloid patients. Um, something that's been kind of controversial for a long time, but um, we feel this is a, a ripe opportunity to ask this question through SWOG, but ultimately in the intergroup setting. So this is a study looking at consol optimal consolidation in amyloid patients, so AL amyloid. Um, and uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. I can go through the details of the concept. So just briefly in background and in lieu of time here, um, so there's only been one randomized study ever that's been done in AL to look at high dose melphalan. And this is an old and outdated study with really high TRMs, about 25%. Um, we now know that the TRMs in experienced centers, um, which would be any center that does at least four transplants a year for amyloid, is actually quite low and very acceptable in the two to five percent range. We also know based on recent single center experience through Mayo and the Anderson, as well as some of our recent CIBMTR data. That induction prior to transplant, even those who had a transplant, is becoming standard of care. And also, that induction, particularly bortezomib based induction and dose of melphalan at transplant, is really what's dictating good outcomes in amyloid patients who do undergo high dose melphalan transplant. We feel this is a really important question because there really are huge um, practice, um, huge differences in practice patterns between what's going on in Europe and the United States, and even in, in between individual centers in the United States. Here, about a third of patients approximately will undergo high-dose melphalan therapy in their uh, initial therapy for amyloid, whereas in Europe, that number is much smaller, um, less than 5% than the recently published alchemy study, and there's other data that would show similar numbers. Um, and although previously challenging, there is more of an appetite to enroll on amyloid trials. That was really shown by the Andromeda trial, which enrolled several hundred patients, and then our recently actually completed SWOG trial in the relapse setting look at isotuximab, um, where we were able to enroll actually very quickly, and, and we show the feasibility here. We can go to the next slide. So just like in uh, myeloma and in amyloid, we have um, pretty good numbers on transplants that are being done um, annually in the United States. And really what we're seeing is around 300 transplants a year are being done, and this is pretty consistent. So we think in terms of, again, feasibility in our enrollment that this um, Although there is new induction therapies that they're still, we're doing about a consistent number, if anything, increasing number of transplants annually. And really there's no studies that have looked at a post-transplant um, uh, uh, kind of quote unquote maintenance or planned therapy. There's been some data looking at consolidation to improve responses. So again, an area we think that would be um, worth investigating. Go to the next slide. So our, our hypothesis for this study um, is that we think that the, the outcomes of patients who would undergo high dose melphalan as part of their consolidation therapy, as opposed to continuing DARA-BCD would be superior. Um, the primary outcome we'd be looking at is this uh, modified progression free survival. So this is a newer composite outcome that was looked at on the Andromeda study where um, we, they looked at a combination of uh, major organ deterioration um, as well as hematological progression. So the, the exact definition is, is listed here, um, but essentially you're kind of combining the important outcomes in our amyloid patients. Is their disease progressing and are their organs doing well and responding to therapy? Um, the primary objective would be to compare, again, two, two approaches, one with our high dose melphalan and transplant, as opposed to continuing DARA-BCD um, as part of their consolidation. And then really important in any amyloid study would be a really in-depth look at quality of life of the different approaches, survival, and then treatment-related mortality. So both in a transplant approach and a non-transplant approach, and then obviously organ and hematological responses and progression. Go to the next slide. So here is the study schema. So um, patients would be enrolled based on eligibility, which I'll talk to a little bit on the next slide. 
Um, all patients um, would um, undergo two cycles of standard DARA BCD induction, just as per actually was done on the enrollment study. And then if they're deemed eligible both at an enrollment and after those two cycles, they would be randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to undergo four additional cycles of DARA BCD consolidation or high dose melphalan as their consolidation therapy. Following this, all patients would go on to DARA Tumab to complete a total of two years of therapy um, in their post consolidation setting. Randomization would occur at the time of enrollment um, when the patients were, were deemed eligible for the study. We'll go to the next slide. So there are many kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria, some of which we've been um, trying to kind of fine tune and come to an agreement on. But kind of the, the keys for the purpose of this meeting today is the patients would have to be deemed eligible for transplant at both diagnosis and after their two cycles of induction. That would really ultimately be left up to the enrollment centers, but we we would build into the protocol and the plan that you know we would really encourage patients to to uh, uh, follow the most updated Mayo criteria for transplant candidacy, and that we feel patients have to have at least a partial response to induction therapy. And I'll talk about this in a second, but to DARA VCD response rates are extremely high. So, but we don't want patients refractory of their primary therapy heading on, on to more of the same therapy, basically. Exclusion criteria would be symptomatic myeloma, but not just based on the specifically on the plasma cell burden in the marrow. And again, those patients who couldn't achieve at least a partial remission to induction, um, they would be not randomized, but would be followed on a registration basis. Uh, next slide. So we feel that the it's it's safe to assume based on the CIBMTR data is that we we showed earlier that about 250 to 300 of these are be, transplants are being annually for amyloid. Um, the outcomes based on the most recent DARA VCD induction show a response rate of about 92%. Um, and importantly, the median time to VGPR or CR is actually very quick on study with quad-based induction in amyloid. Only 17 days for VGPR and 60 days for CR, which is kind of where we came up with the ultimately the concept of doing two cycles of induction before randomized to consolidation. We are going to lose some patients due to lack of response and then some due to toxicity. We are kind of reworking some of our statistics actually right now to look at a difference um, in terms of a 10 versus 20% dropout rate and what that might mean to our numbers. But certainly as many AMLA studies have shown, this is an issue that we have to be prepared for in terms of feasibility. Uh, next slide. So this is a little bit of a moving target, but this is some of the modeling that we've done so far. Um, I don't think this will change in any significant way as, but we are again looking at some different dropout rates and we're also gonna be looking at a a two sided type one error. So we're going to modify this a little bit, but I think these general numbers are about where we'll end up. So we're looking to enroll approximately 230 patients in total at time of randomization on a one to one basis. Um, we'd be looking to um, accrue about 10 patients per month over about two years to do our accrual. So again, some of these numbers are going to move a little bit, but this is the general concept as we have it designed now. Um, and then kind of uh, importantly, we did actually, in terms of feasibility and practice patterns, send out a survey through the BMT CTN myeloma intergroup, which really showed a lot of feasibility in terms of interest of, of being involved in the study, and again, um, in terms of practice patterns um, currently. So, so that's very uh, encouraging, and the kind of the concept continues to be fine tuned a little bit, but I think we're getting pretty close to formally submitting and hopefully moving this forward as an important not only SWOG led study but intergroup study with formal support again by the BMT CTN. And I think that's the last slide, if I remember correctly. Yes. Very good. Well, thanks very much. Now, I would, did want to also turn over the projector to Christina Gowan because she was going to present an update on her plasma cell leukemia concept. I think she sent slides in, but it was after the meeting began, so I wasn't able to incorporate them into my file. Christina, are you still on? I am. Um, if the coordinator could give me access to share my slides. Ah, lovely. Can you see one screen or two screens? Yeah. 
Whiskey one's whiskey green. One's green. Sure. Whiskey one's green. Good. Thank you. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present the concept of primary plasma cell leukemia concept. And so we will start with some background. One to two percent of all plasma cell neoplasms are plasma cell leukemia. And as we know, this is really the most aggressive of all of the monoclonal gammopathies with a very poor survival, median survival, depending on the literature that you look at is 10 to 15 months. And data are limited given the rarity of disease, which is truly highlighting the importance of tackling therapeutic strategies within a cooperative group network. We know that there are two forms of the disease, primary plasma cell leukemia, which is de novo on presentation versus a secondary form, which is arising from an antecedent multiple myeloma diagnosis. And we also know that these are very different clinical and molecular entities and is why we are targeting the primary only plasma cell leukemia in this concept. The definition of plasma cell leukemia is traditionally 20% or greater circulating plasma cells with an absolute greater than two. Yet several retrospective and other analyses have looked at greater than or equal to 5% circulating plasma cells of having truly similar outcomes. And as we're trying to plan this trial for the future and, and to be truly clinically relevant for the future, the, the threshold is likely going to be moved lower. And so we are proposing to use this definition. There is no standard of care for the treatment of plasma cell leukemia, either primary or secondary. We tend to use VTD place like regimens for induction or a triplet or quadruplet induction followed by high dose melphalan with autologous stem cell rescue. So belantamab mafodoin is a BCMA, B-cell maturation antigen-directed immunoconjugate. And it is a microtubule inhibitor. It is the first immunoconjugate approved in multiple myeloma for those that are heavily pretreated, greater than four prior therapies, including anti-CD38, a proteasome inhibitor, as well as an immunomodulatory agent. We know that there are side effects associated with this, including changes in the corneal epithelium. So you'll see visual acuity changes, corneal ulcers, dry eyes, or blurred vision. The FDA approval, which came last year in August, uh, was based from this DREAM2 study, which was a randomized open label multi-centered study. Pretty good overall response rates for heavily pretreated population, 32%, uh, significant amount of keratopathy, grade three, 44%, but this is truly managed well with dose reduction or dose delays. And it really has been within standard of care, multiple myeloma, a valuable contribution to our treatment armamentarium. Many new combination trials are underway including, and importantly, the DREAM9 trial with Belantamab Mapidoin plus VRD. So our concept is a phase two single arm trial of Belantamab Mapidoin added to active therapy, which is VRD for primary, again, plasma cell leukemia patients. And our primary objective within this trial is to evaluate the progression-free survival in newly diagnosed primary plasma cell leukemia patients as compared to a historical control and to enhance the potential accrual and the patient numbers, we are proposing to include both transplant eligible and ineligible patients. Secondary objectives would include to evaluate the overall response to the novel treatment combination to assess the safety um, and to describe the median time to response per the IMWG criteria, and importantly, to also look at MRD negativity at day 100 and day 180 if they undergo autologous bone marrow transplant or after six cycles of the treatment combination if they did not. And to assess the impact of the novel treatment regimen on quality of life, which is always an important endpoint in all of our trials. Here's the study schema, which is currently proposed. It's still in conversation with GSK, which has been very supportive of the concept thus far, and we'll be uh, discussing this with their global uh, team next month. But we are proposing this, that we treat with an induction and, and patients would be allowed to have one cycle of prior treatment before enrollment, but four cycles of RVD or VRD, belantamab, mafodoitin, 
uh, with a 21-day uh, treatment cycle, and the belantamab would be dosed at 1.9 milligrams per meter squared, Q3 weeks to enhance the tolerance of this uh, therapeutic followed by autologous stem cell transplant if they were eligible per the eligible um, or per the treatment center guidelines, followed by consolidation of two cycles of the RVD belantamab at the similar dosing. And then finally, maintenance ongoing therapy with an RVD light like protocol and continued dosing with the belantamab, but at a reduced frequency at a Q8 week frequency. Key inclusion criteria, Particip participants must have a documented diagnosed primary PCL with greater than or equal to 5% circulating plasma cells, again, to enhance accrual and likely to represent the new upcoming uh, definition of PCL. No prior history of multiple myeloma. Again, this is in primary plasma cell leukemia, measurable disease, an adequate ECOG performance status, kidney function, liver function, and bone marrow function, as well as no corneal epithelial disease except mild changes within the corneal epithelium. Here are our statistics. Thank you very much, Adam and Anjay, for uh, contributing to this and the historical control based on the University of Arkansas data, as well as other retrospective and prospective analysis uh, was deemed at 12 months as the most appropriate cutoff. And we hypothesized that with the combination treatment plus or minus auto transplant, the improved median survival will go to 24 months. And this would be corresponding to a hazard ratio of two uh, with 46 eligible patients accrued over four years, an additional follow-up of one year. This is a 90% power to detect an increase in the 12 months, which we discussed. Uh, it is anticipated that approximately 52 patients in total will need to be accrued for the trial to account for a 10% in eligibility rate. And I will tell you that we had many different iterations of this statistical design. And this was thought to be the most feasible to truly attain both uh, a number we can accrue to, but also a clinically significant result. We'd like to also partner with GSK, who has been supportive to do robust translational work. This is a unique opportunity to really profile these patients. And so we have partnered with TGen to do, again, some really great genomic profiling of our study participants. Uh, we'll be looking at bulk RNA sequencing, BCMA expression over time, proliferative index, and single cell RNA seq. We'll be looking at multiple time points. This will depend on the funding that we can obtain for this and the amount that GSK will support. But right now, we are proposing that we do this at baseline at the completion of induction, day 100, day 180, post transplant, or six cycles of the combination therapy and at the event uh, progression of disease. So this is my email. If you have ideas about the study, please let me know. I would really love your input. And before my time is up, I did want to put a plug in for um, the Equate trial because I am the champion uh, for this trial. This is an ECOG trial. It's EAA181. This is effective quadruplet utilization after treatment evaluation, a randomized phase three trial for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma not intended for early autologous stem cell transplant. These patients are uh, started on therapy, induction therapy with DRD. They do nine cycles, MRD testing, and then are randomized to either continue on to that therapy or to add on a proteasome inhibitor with bortezomib. And so this is a really great trial kind of answering the question on who really needs quadruplet therapy and can we use MRD testing to help dictate that. There are 386 sites approved. The current accrual is five, 12 have been screened, but the goal is 1450. So still a lot of time to get involved into this trial. Uh, here is the hyperlink if you're interested to uh, receive the information, the um, FAQs, et cetera, as well as the clinicaltrials.gov ID number. And I will stop sharing my slides. 
All right, thanks very much, Christina. One question uh, going back to the PCL study, you had said that uh, a prior diagnosis of myeloma would exclude people, but I'm assuming you'd be okay with a prior diagnosis of smoldering myeloma as long as they were untreated? I think that's an important point. We haven't really discussed that, but but yes, according to how it's written now, they they would be included. Okay, it might I think be it's worth really clarifying. Yeah, it might be worth clarifying because presumably you'd be okay with those people. Right, because they would be treatment naive. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, also, I, I did have a question about the correlatives. I, I wasn't quite clear on the rationale for doing uh, bulk RNA sequencing and also single cell RNA sequencing. Um, is is that going to be done on everybody or some going to get bulk and some single cell? I'd like to try to understand that. Well, this was really developed by Jonathan Keats at TGen, and so that was his proposal. But yes, the proposal is for every patient to get both. Um, and, and I would have to get back to you on his rationale for that. Okay. I mean, I think the single cell would be especially interesting, okay. and I'm not sure what the rationale is for doing bulk in addition to single cell other than to show that the single cell is better, which we pretty much already know. Very good. Hi, Hi Christina. Uh, I just had a comment about uh, the corneal toxicity of this drug. So I think the question uh, is the feasibility, you know, of being able to give the drug for the duration that's planned and also, you know, how to sort of convince the patients to really take this drug right at the beginning of the treatments. Because, you know, they have so many options. Why? How do we convince a patient to take something that could potentially mess up their cornea right at the beginning uh, of, of their treatment? I think that's a really important point. And I would say that although there is a significant amount of keratopathy, it's usually reversible. And and can be modulated by either dose reduction or dose delay, and so that would be my conversation with the patient. And we don't have very good therapeutics, right, for primary plasma cell leukemia as far as standard of care. So that again would be another conversation is uh, that this is adding to our our evidence base and um, contributing to the to the research. Great. Yeah, the median survival for these folks, unfortunately, is rather short right now. So it's not quite the same as giving belantamab to a newly diagnosed myeloma patient where you would have a reasonable expectation that they would live 10 to 15 years at this point, especially if they're standard risk. These PCL folks usually have higher risk disease. So um, unfortunately, probably two to three years is what we'd be looking at for median overall survival at this point. Although I've got the... Uh, um, from the original uh, high-risk study that Saad had, I still have uh, one patient who went on with plasma cell leukemia and is still doing well. Um, so it's certainly, uh, there is heterogeneous prognosis there, but the majority, unfortunately, would be probably two to three years, I would guess. All right. I did want to let you know that there are still some other concepts that are being discussed that probably are not quite yet ready for presentation, but hopefully will be by the fall, including a nice trial to look at high-risk relapse disease with a Selenexor-based combination. And there are also other discussions about trials for amyloid and Waldenstrom. So keep in mind other concept areas that could be up for grabs. I think for right now, once we get the high risk newly diagnosed study open, 
the high risk and standard risk, and then the frail patients will be taken care of for a few years. Um, but I did want to, again, thank everybody for their great level of engagement. Uh, we've got, I think, a great group of investigators who are really excited to work with SWOG, and it's exciting to work with all of you and hopefully looking forward to getting these studies done quickly and answering these important questions that you're asking. Any other topics that folks want to bring up for discussion today or maybe for the next call, which would be in May? All right. Well, if not, did want to wish everybody a great rest of their Friday and weekend and great rest of April. And we'll touch base again with everybody in May on the monthly call and enjoy the rest of the SWOG meeting as well. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.